Good evening, everyone. Happy Pride, and welcome to our panel discussion this evening. My name is David Gardnier, and I go by he, she, or they pronouns, and I'm a part of Out in Santa Monica, which is the LGBT plus affinity group for the city. Out in Santa Monica is proud to put on tonight's event, BIPOC, Queer, and Proud, honoring the queer community who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Tonight's discussion is an important one to be having both within our own queer community and with our allies. Queer folks who are BIPOC still endure rejection and even hatred from their families and community because of their queerness. Unfortunately, this rejection often continues into the broader queer community where they face discrimination because of their race. The long history of racism from queer folks who are white has led to queer spaces that predominantly center white gays, meaning that often the queer community that was supposed to be their safe haven is yet another disappointment for BIPOC folks. In spite of this, there are many joys that come with being queer and BIPOC, and tonight we hope to touch on all of this, the joys and the struggles, the barriers and the belonging unique to the BIPOC queer community. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Delena, to introduce our moderator. Hello, everyone. My name is Delena Benacama, and I am the Equity and Communications Coordinator for the city. Given the work we've done over the past year to advance racial equity and inclusion, it's imperative to devote time not only during Pride Month, but also year round to amplify the voices of LGBTQ plus community members who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color. I'm honored to be here tonight as an ally for the LGBTQ plus BIPOC community to learn directly from them about their experiences and how we can continue advocating for them. Before I introduce our moderator, I want to give a shout out to Elizabeth Krieger, who is a longtime advocate for the LGBTQ plus community, a family friend, and the community relations representative and marketing strategist for HealthNet's community partnership program. Elizabeth referred our moderator, Jasmine Creighton, who I'm excited is joining us for this important discussion tonight. For more than three decades, Jasmine Creighton has worked as a tireless advocate for the transgender community, while at the same time carving out her career in show business. She is the Associate Director for the Asian Pacific AIDS Intervention Team in Los Angeles. She is also the coordinator of the Midnight Stroll, which brings awareness and needed self-care supplies for street-based sex workers to empower them to embrace comprehensive community resources, such as HIV testing and treatment, housing services, substance abuse counseling, legal and victim advocacy, and medical services. Jasmine also co-executive produced a play and documentary that challenges viewers to move past their preconceived stereotypes about the complexities of sexual identities and orientation so they can see the commonalities that we all share as human beings. Please welcome Jasmine Creighton. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, David. Delena, we really appreciate you being here tonight, I do, and uh, my panelists, we're honored to be here. Thank you, Santa Monica, for having us tonight. Um, I want to introduce our panel, and I want to start off with Jose Richard Aviles, goes by he, they pronouns, and is the and is a multimedia artist, urban planner, and social worker based out of Los Angeles. As a former organizer and a current artist, Jose is interested in the intersections between space and justice, laughter and resistance, and the magic of the stage. Please welcome Jose. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. I know it's a mouthful, like you do all those things. Listen, I wear multiple hats, but they are all threaded with the needle of justice, always advocating yeah. for community. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Jose, for being here tonight. Next, we have Asher Hung, goes by he, him, his pronouns, and is an LA native, Chinese American gay identified cisgender psychotherapist. Uh, a psychotherapy associate practicing LGBTQ affirming therapy. 
His insight into the mental health field are particularly valuable valuable during this time of turmoil in our world. And we look forward to hearing his thoughts on how this <clears throat> on how this is particularly affecting the queer and BIPOC community. Welcome, hon. Welcome, Asher, hon. <laughs> Mr. Hon. <laughs> oh, we can't hear you. Can you unmute for one second? There we are. Hi, I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much. Happy to support everything about uh, BIPOC queer communities. Amazing. Thank you. Next, we have Fatima Malika Shabazz, goes by she, her pronouns, originally hails from Brooklyn, New York, is a longtime resident of Los Angeles and is the CEO president of Fatima's, uh, Fatima Speaks LLC, a transgender-led African-American owned and operated business that conducts cultural sensitivity and comp competency training, as well as panel and motivational speaking engagement. Fatima, welcome. Hi, everybody. Glad to be here. Looking forward to the event. Awesome. Thank you for being here. And we would like to welcome Miss Gabriella, or Gabby, as she's known to most, has been in the field of HIV since 1997. She first became a certified HIV counselor in 1999. With 22 years, a formal HIV experience. Gabby has held multiple positions in HIV and public health, initially as a frontline HIV worker and 18 years in leadership roles, which includes management, prevention, and care services, including Hep C, PrEP, and PEP access. Her experience includes working in the nonprofit, for profit, and government sector. Gabby has been involved in local, state, and national HIV planning groups to ensure the needs of minority groups and representation, or rep are represented, excuse me. In 2017, Gabby co-founded the Indigenous Pride Los Angeles, IPLA, a social activist and pride organization for Native and Indigenous LGBTQ two-spirit Indigenous people. IPLA hosts the only pride event in California that is specific to indigenous and native to indigenous native LGBTQ uh, persons. Additionally, it's an indigenous and, na and native American members work all year work all year round to help reduce social disparities, connection and reconnection to ancestry, heritage and cultural as a method to reduce mental health, substance misuse, and increase social cultural uh, co connectivity. Gabby is a subject matter. Gabby is a subject matter expert in addressing HIV, LGBTQ stigma, HIV prevention, and continuum care, mental health, community engagement, and mobilization, as well as leadership development. Please help us welcome Ms. Gabby Leon. That was a mouthful. <laughs> as well, I'm, I'm really I'm happy to be here, um, and thank you so much for. Um, opening space uh, to Indigenous, Native, uh, uh, Two-Spirit people on the panel as well. It's an honor to have you here. I'm going to open it up to, I'm going to start with uh, Jose. I want to know, um, and this is for all, I'm going to ask all the panelists this, like, how have you been doing? Tell us about yourself, you know? Happy Pride to you first. Thank you. Pride. Thank you. Thank you. I can't. Let me start off by sharing a very unpopular <laughs> opinion. <laughs> I love the fact that it's Pride Month, but I am not a fan of the aesthetic of the rainbow. <laughs> it's just too many colors at once. I'm like, no, I like to color block, not color mesh. <laughs> but yeah, that was just something I, somebody asked me that yesterday and they were like, I never see you wear any rainbows. And it's like, mm, my politic and work speaks for itself. I'm just not a fan of that aesthetic. It reminds me of tie dyes and I'm not a fan of tie dyes. But I am doing well, thank you. Um, you know, uh, the things, some of the things that I do, I am an urban planner. Um, I currently work for the Los Angeles Department of Transportation. I'm also a social worker. So a lot of my work focuses is on how community trauma exists in the built environment and how we can use design to address some of that trauma that results that's in the built environment. So I focus, I say that planners are therapists and the city is our clients. 
And so I focus a lot on that work. And then on top of all those things, I'm an artist. Specifically, I trained as a choreographer and a dancer. Dance will always be my first romance. I just have the honor and the pleasure now of being a published poet. I just published my first book of poetry. The second one should be coming out in the next couple of months. And the third one is being imagined as we speak. Um, but, you know, I like to think of myself as someone who is always committed to people, never institutions. I work within, without, and against the state. Uh, and always, my art is always against the state. And no one can call me out on my truth. But usually because I work within the government, we have to work within the state and we infiltrate. But always a commitment to the liberation of my community. Uh, and that's a little bit about me. I'm just a little, you know, just a kid from South Central, always calling out something, some institution, and always with a little bit of joy and laughter and some desmadre. <laughs> Thank you for that fire. Thank you. Caliente. <laughs> Asha, tell us a little bit about you. And I want to know, you know, why do you love your queer BIPOC identity? Oh, well, wow. well, let's see. Uh, first, to answer your first question, I'm doing well. I, uh, I have been very um, uh, thoughtful and careful about uh, making sure I'm taking care of myself during this global pandemic. I mean, it is something that is affecting all of us. And uh, self-care, super important, whatever it means to each person. Uh, I just discovered I love gardening, and that's really been helpful for me. Um, the other thing is I, I, I really believe that we should all be going through life with a highlighter and not a red pen. So looking for the bright spots in my life, even if I'm in quarantine or, you know, in fear of, of COVID, there's still good things happening. Let's not miss out on them. So, uh, you know, but uh, my, uh, my queer and BIPOC identity, I think it just adds more layers of wonderfulness. I mean, the more that I can dig into where I come from and who I am, and then know that that's a unique combination, uh, and then live out loud as that person, it just it makes me feel good, and it also gives more people uh, more and different models to look at how their life could be, however they want to live their life. Amazing. Thank you, Asha. Fatima, Goddess Fatima, talk to us. How are you doing? Okay, you know, it's, uh, last 15 months have been a little rough sometimes. Hit a few bumps and bruises here and there. Um, it's a long way from when this thing started. The day that they declared this a pandemic, I was in D.C. for a black and paint conference with the FIP group, and we didn't know if we were going to make it out. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't know what was going on with the airports, if they were shutting them down. Um, and there was only, a, uh, most of the people on my FIP group actually live in that general area. So they can just hop on a train and go back to Jersey or New York or where, you know, in that area. But a few of us had to fly out. And that was, we didn't know how that was gonna work out. You know, um, as it happened, the airports are actually pretty cool. On both of my flights back in, I got upgraded to first class, had my own row. So that worked out. But um, by and large, I think that I haven't really changed a lot of what I was doing before the pandemic, except for, um, hell, I haven't really changed anything. I was going out when they were telling us to stay in. You know? <laughs> I still don't sleep. I've been a chronic insomniac since I was like 12, you know. So imagine you telling me to stay in and you know that I can't sleep. And then how is that going to work, you know? Um, but I have this desire to, to always make sure that people that I personally know are okay, right? And if I know you and I feel like you're good, then the people that come with you, as far as I'm concerned, are good until they do something stupid and make me not, you know, want to be bothered with them. Um, but I, I've always had that concern that people are okay, you know, because I can take care of myself. I'm pretty good at taking care of me. But there are people who can't always take care of themselves and they need some assistance. And a lot of our family won't ask for assistance. You know, I'm like one of those people. I hate asking for help because it makes me feel like I'm a beggar. And I don't want to, you know, feel like I'm begging someone for something. But I've been on point with this for a long time. I paid attention to what's happening um, in terms of what's going on with the community from a legal standpoint. I'm a warrior and a soldier for the LGBT community in every sense of the word, you know. Um, for those of you who don't know, up until recently, um, I was a regular uh, underground MMA fighter. 
a couple belts, and, and then I retired, and now I just go back and I, and I fight, you know, classic fights, legend fights, because I'm a legend at the uh, at the underground. So um, I encourage people who have a problem with our community to stay away from me. Okay, I love that. <laughs> our <know>. house, <laughs> watch your back. Exactly. We thank you for your leadership. Uh, I support my folks. I really do. I try to make sure that everyone has the resources that they need, uh, or I direct them to someone who can get them those resources. You know, and I kind of feel like if we are not doing the things that are necessary to make our village work, then we are failing as people. Thank you, Fatima. It's such an honor to have you here. We appreciate. It. I want to move on to the mistress of healing, our very own Miss Gabrielle Leon. A fun fact. Ms. Gabby was my manager. She was my boss at APIT several years ago. And she continues in the fight, in the, in the journey, in the struggle, and the thriving of our community. So it's an honor to have you here. Gabby, tell us how you're doing. Um, I, as people were, were um, you know, talking about how they've, they've been since this whole pandemic, you know, I, I've thought about what an adventure we've lived for a year and a half. And I think that compared to another pandemic that all of us have lived through, which is uh, HIV, uh, the HIV and AIDS pandemic. Um, we don't realize that this, is, this COVID is our second pandemic. And I, I you know, have taken a note from, from the HIV epidemic and just lived my best life. Um, I ate so much, I've gained weight, I lost jobs, I gained jobs, um, I got, you know, laid off, I got promoted. So everything has happened that is just precious, um, you know, during COVID. I'm trying to get rid of the, of the, of the pounds, but I would not want to get rid of the experience of, of, you know, what this has meant. Um, you know, because I think for, for, for many of us, um, even uh, getting that little unemployment check, uh, you know, learning to, to take care of ourselves, you know, balancing the quality of our life. Um, for many of us that, that did get the opportunity to work from home, we saw how life can be, um, how amazing it could be not to have to think about what we're going to put on a daily basis and, and not to be on alley traffic. And, and so for me, it's been, it's been a wonderful experience uh, from, from that perspective, from the perspective of loss. You know, I've had many losses of people who have passed due to COVID. Um, so I think that, that, you know, it's, it's, it, it's very reminiscent of, of the first uh, epidemic that I've lived. But it, like I said, you know, I've, I've made sure that I've enjoyed every single moment. Such an honor to have you here. Thank you, Gabby. I want to mention this. I know that um, on our originally we had you the Begay that was supposed to be on the panel and, and Gabby would stepped in the, literally the very last minute. We want to send so much love and light, healthy healing vibrations to you, Wei, um, and we hope that all is all is well in her well in her world tonight. So we're sending you love tonight, you may. Jose, I have a question for you. How do you feel about the representation and the portrayal of BIPOC queer people in media? And does it help advance understanding of the queer narrative in these times? Yeah, you know, I think from from what we've seen, you know, when a lot of the in in, in the beginning, I think a lot of the times some of the first folks that uh the first sort of representation that we saw of LGBT folks in the media, at least here in the US, you know, happened in like in the 90s with Ellen, right, in her sitcom show. And then we've seen the development of that. Uh, we've seen the progression. We've seen where queer folks have stepped away from just being that character, the caricature specifically, right, in that mockery of the identity to stepping into supporting roles, to being protagonist. I think now we're also seeing that folks are complicating the narrative of the identity, right? We, we're we seeing that queer folks come in all sexualities and all energies and all bodies and all genders and all colors, right? Um, I think currently, particularly, personally, 
I'm interested in complicating, I think, the identity a little further. I think specifically at the intersection of being queer and being brown. I'm not from East, I'm not from East LA. <laughs> you know what I mean? And a lot of the brown narrative is rooted in, in East LA narrative, which is predominantly or can be a second, third generation Chicano movement. I'm also mm -hmm. Salvadorian and Chicanismo is not necessarily rooted in, in Central American culture. So where is the narrative? of the queer brown person from South Central who discovered their queerness on the bus, right? And I think at one point in, in, the, in the search for representation, I was waiting for someone else to tell my story because I am that queer brown person from South Central who discovered their queerness on the bus. And now rather than waiting for someone to tell my story, I've made it sort of like, how can I share my story? while being mindful and honoring those who came before me, of course. Um, and I can think of, of a, specific, a particular moment, right, in how we have to complicate the narrative a little bit more, especially as queer folks of color. But I remember at a time when the Laramie Project was out and we were talking a lot about Matthew Shepard and, and you know, Angels in America, there was also the narrative of Gwen Araujo, a trans Latina woman that was murdered around the same time. And, you know, I, I was blessed that I had mentors and older folks who who shared that narrative with me and I would have, you know, fallen into a more pop culture sort of for a popular way at looking at, a, you know, Boys in the Hood and uh, Boys Don't Cry. Boys in the Hood is another movie. <laughs> Uh, but you know, okay. you, you, you know, South Central came out. I forgot. My bad. I had to put on the queer. <laughs> uh, but, you know, and so complicating, I think the narrative is important. Uh, right now, I'm also really interested in also taking in a little bit more media from from Mexico right now on Netflix, there's something called the Dance of the 41, El Baile de los 41, which is a particular moment that happened in Mexicans history and in queerness and queer identity in Mexico. Now I'm not from Mexico, I was born in the US, but my mother is from Mexico. So now there's a connection to a displaced spirit, you know, as a result of colonization, of course, and complicating my own identity and being like, oh, I'm a queer ethical subject in the US, but I'm also a queer ethical subject in Mexico, my mother's home country. So finding that connection is now complicating a lot of my own narrative. Um, so I think, you know, there has been a lot of progression. As someone who's been an organizer for the last 15 years, I feel like I've seen a lot of that progression from mm -hmm. 1996 to today, like from the Ellen show to like Pose maybe, or Euphoria yeah. shows that are, you know, doing, I think a great job at, 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 at complicating the queer narrative. And I think it's now an opportunity for us to, to share more of that narrative. I think from folks who, now the conversation is not so much about representation, but rather from access, um, it's so folks who have the, the, you know, instead of being gatekeepers to be able to tell these narratives is how are they investing in the community who have the lived experience, but may not have the technical experience, right? The lived experience should be leveraged of greater value than the technical experience. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. No. Thank you. Um, Asher, according to researches by, uh, the William Institute, LGBTQ adults are twice as likely as the general population to have experienced homelessness in their lifetime. And that number is disproportionately higher amongst Black LGBTQ uh, community members and people of color. So uh, when it comes to LGBTQ youth, they are 120% more likely to experience homelessness than non-LGBTQ youth. Can you talk about that discrimination? Absolutely. I, you know, I also think that an important factor in this is COVID and that a lot of gay youth has uh, been required out of survival to move back in with their families. And sometimes those are not validating, accepting or welcoming environments. Um, it's, uh, and, and in some cases, uh, the, the the difference of opinions may mean being kicked out of your home. So this is something that is that is happening, and it's happening more right now. Even if it's just being at home and being under the stress of not being able to be yourself, or to have lost the gains that you've made by uh, exploring who you are out in the world, uh, these are serious problems for uh, gay youth right now and trans youth. So uh, the next step in this problem is that there are some uh, uh, structural problems with uh, all of the services that are providing uh, housing and shelter for 
homeless youth, and especially when it comes to gender. The, you know, the, the bi-gender division of are you a man or are you a woman, and we don't have space for anything in between or otherwise, is not only uh, not doing the public service, but also, um, you know, bringing down the hammer on, again and again over and over on uh, these people's de developing identities and their self-esteem and their self-respect. So these are things that uh, that are very important to change. Um, I, you know, I think that there are organizations out there, uh, like by no, uh, Break the Binary, who can do uh, workshops and uh, training um, toolkits uh, and best practices to make this better. Some of the changes are easy, really easy. Some of the changes are harder. Let's at least start with the easy ones, please, and make sure that, you know, these kids are actually getting uh, the care and the welcoming that, that they deserve and that um, there's enough of a comfortable environment to really talk about what's happening and to ask questions or to give answers that will really truly help them. Uh, but the, that is a shift that needs to happen. Yes, beautiful. I always say that, you know, my trans and queer identity is not up for discussion, right? Um, but with, because my love doesn't harm anybody, but what does harm people is not having access to mental health, to food, right, to shelter, to the basic needs, and if people's basic needs are not being met, then everything else is out the door, right? People are not accessing these services if they don't, if they just can't have someone to eat and sleep and, and rest, right? So thank you. I know that you have um, some type of resource uh, that you, you, you're you able to provide, we're able to provide through this at the end of the run, so we'll talk about that a little later. Fatima. The Human Rights Campaign, this question is for you, reports that fatal violence disproportionately affects transgender women of color, particularly black transgender women. Can you talk to us about what community, what community members and local governments can do to support transgender women of color? Yeah, first of all, we have to stop thinking that we are, that we are so different that um, the differences mean that a straight or a cisgender person's life is more valuable than a trans woman's life. First of all, we are far more across the board, regardless of how you identify along the spectrum, we are far more similar than we are dissimilar. We all have many of the same issues. Got to pay your rent, get kicked out. Got to pay your car note, they take the car back. You know, got to be to work on time, you get fired. Unless you work for yourself and then you can, nobody can fire you. The reality is that <clears throat> Our community, are, we're seen basically as a third or fourth class group of people living in, in this society. So it is appalling to watch people stand on the side of the street and use their, their camera phones to take pictures and video of a trans woman being beaten up on the street as opposed to getting off your ass and going to assist that person because that's a human being. End of the day, regardless of how you feel about how that person identifies in their lifestyle, that's still a human being. And their lives are deserving of, um, you know, liberty and, and, and freedom and, 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 and this respect and dignity just like yours is. You know, how would you feel if I stood on the side and watched your cisgender sister get beat out, get beat up because somebody just didn't like the way that she looked or something that, you know what I mean? So as a community, we really need to have this understanding of what it means when someone says it takes a village. Because in a real village, that doesn't happen. You know, in a, in a, in a village environment, in a hive mind environment, each one teaches one and each one takes care of one. And it doesn't matter, you know, how big or small you are, whether, you know, your stripe is yellow and the other bee stripe is blue. You're in this hive, we got you. You know, so we're part of the human race. So when, you know, the question was asked in the Bible, am I my brother's keeper? Hell yeah, you are. And if you don't do that, then at the end of your time, you got to answer to God for that. You know, so that's my, that, uh, you know. <laughs> no, that's excellent. That's, 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 yeah, I, before we started, you know, you 
you you know enlighten us that you know um within the last month or two months two trans women were killed in the city. oh two last, last two weeks. weeks but two yeah. two uh trans women of color were murdered on the same day i was yes. a party can you speak to that i mean yeah um about a week ago i did a um a part panel part training session with this group called bully and one of the participants on the panel along with myself may mention that uh, in the same city, same state, that two trans women were murdered on the same day. Now, since 2000, since 2019, we have had upwards of 30 trans women of color murdered in this country. Um, I personally have suffered that loss. I had a cousin who was 19, who was a former, um, well, she was getting out of being a street-based sex worker, which I am also formerly a street-based sex worker. And on the night before she was supposed to move into her apartment, she just walked by a guy that was apparently a client of hers, a regular guy for a, for like maybe two or three years. She didn't really make any big deal about it. She, you know, being cordial and being respectful, she just said hi and kind of kept moving. Well, this guy, apparently um, his friends started to clown him and I don't know what happened after that, but the end result was that he knocked on her door, her hotel room door, when she opened the door, he shot her to death. Right. Um, so I have a personal stake in that. You know, it is ridiculous. It is appalling. You know, so don't talk to me about black on black crime. Man, don't talk to me about the war on drugs. Don't talk to me about none of that crap. Don't talk to me about, you know, what's happening with law enforcement and the, and the department. We see what's happening with them. You know, cops have gotten so bold that they don't even care about killing us on camera anymore. You know, and they locking us up, man, for so much time. It's like these people are body shopping because they need the bodies to fill these facilities um, that, that are privately owned now, right? But tell me what you're going to do, man, about all of these trans women that are being murdered, being misgendered and misnamed when they're put in the paper, being dead named, right? And the investigation lasting all of a day. And no one has ever brought to justice for these things. You know, I may mention that the thing that I did not long ago for black women, period, that a friend of mine who lives out in West Covina was stabbed in, in, in another friend's house. And the guy that stabbed her almost took her life, was out of jail before she got out of the hospital. You know, so I don't want to hear nothing about anything that's going on with white privilege because white people, you know, ain't stabbing my folks like that. They're not shooting my people like that. You know what I'm saying? But they need to take that white privilege and do something about that and make these laws more enforceable. Thank you. My deepest condolences to you. You know, um, it was interesting because last year on record, uh, 44 trans women were murdered last year when we were all supposed to be indoors. So it's like, how do people find time to harm, you know, and, and, and kill our people, you know, when we were in, uh, in the middle of a pandemic? It just goes to show it's a casualty. There's like, there's like a, a disconnect uh, about our, our, our wealth, our, you know, our worth and about like who we are. So I just thank you, Patina, for being that voice, for being that, that act, being activated, right? And that activist and showing up for everyone. About, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but we got to be more careful about the people that we put in office. You know, people like that Trump, Donald Trump, the, this, the, the, the poison that he spit from the highest seat in the land helped that. It gave people license to do that, you know? So we need to take those licenses away. And I'm down for that in any way it needs to be done. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, Gabby, I wanna ask, you know, in the news uh, last couple of years, We've, we've heard about, um, you know, the disproportionate uh, amount of missing indigenous folks, right? Specifically like trans women and uh, trans and queer folks, right? In the community. I mean, it, it was real big news like a year or so ago. And I was wondering if you could really speak to that, like, you know, what was happening, you know, on reservations or can you talk to yeah. us about that? You know, it's, it's um, I don't think that we need to even reference things about a year ago, just as recent as 
this month, bodies of children have been uncovered both in here in this in this northern hemisphere and in the south of, of Mexico in churches in schools schools um, where um, native children who were taken from their community from their tribes to put in these boarding schools um, whose parents didn't know what happened to them you know, two years um, maybe have gone by in some cases before a parent knew that a child had had passed away, um, and so we know that that indigenous children were put in these boarding boarding schools, um, and in you know the the children that were found in in, in Mexico over 800 bodies were uncovered in a church, so. You know, we we continue to be um, victims of of that targeted hatred of that, and and I think that everyone in this panel can relate to how you know just because of who you are, just because of how you look, just because of what people perceive that you are, you're being targeted, victimized put in cages um, and and so our humanity is taken away. Who we are as people is taken away. And I think that, that I don't think, I know that we've had enough and that enough has shown time and time again in the last year. Um, I remember being, being um, in my apartment last year uh, around the time of, of George, George Floyd and I remember having this this sentiment of of a feeling that I had no power, that at any point in time someone could just walk up to me and and because of who they believe I am or what they believe I am, they could just take my life away. And that I always have to be careful not only of 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 a stranger out on the street, but of police. That if I get pulled over, that that my likelihood, you know, may not be that of a black man, but that I could also be a victim. And so getting out and protesting, you know, felt like the right thing to do. And I think for many of us, it felt like the right thing to do. And I think that, you know, we, m many groups like indigenous groups, we've been, we've been programmed to be quiet, to not stir the pot, that if we just keep keep our head down, you know, the, the analogy is like a chicken with their with weights around their neck, that if we don't stir the waters, that you know, we will be um we will be invisible and no one will hurt us. What I saw, you know, what felt great, and I think that it's what we need to continue to do is take to the streets and demand justice demand justice for those missing children, demand justice for murdered trans women. You know, where are those indigenous women that go missing? Where where, where, where do our people go? You know, where are those kids um, that are in cages currently? Currently, we have children from, from Central America and Mexico caged up, that they can't find their parents, they can't be reunited. And so I think that that you know we we need to speak up and and we need to stop being afraid because we're gonna in the case of a lot of uh, indigenous people from other countries because we don't we don't want to be deported be deported to our own land and so I think that that you know as people of color we need to stick together and we need to show up for each other. Thank you. You said something, every, Jewel, like, thank you, everything. But the one thing you ever, I heard real clear is like, got to hold our heads down so no one can see us. But if they can't see you, they can't provide for you, right? They can't, they can't support you or help you because you're not there. So this whole yeah. uh, thing about being visible and being present, being loud and and proud, like it really rings true with everything you just said. Like, 
people, we have to step into our greatness, right? Boldly and brilliantly. Yes, yes. And, and, and you know, um, when, when I personally started to do that is, it was in the census uh, that I, 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 I thought about and I had to think about what what bubble do I circle? What choice do I pick when it came to to my race and my ethnicity? And I was like, why am I going to stop denying the fact that I'm that I'm native, that I'm indigenous, that I'm native to this land? But yet I've been conditioned to put on that census questionnaire and and all the demographic questionnaires that I feel when I go to the doctor or any other program that I've ever participated to pick white because I, I didn't believe that I could pick native. And, and to me, I, I am now reconnecting. I'm, I, I wanna be visible. I want my voice to be heard. And, and I may not know my indigenous language, but I know my indigenous roots. And so being a voice for those that may not, may not know that they can speak up, uh, being a voice for those, I think it's everyone's job for those of us that that know how uh, the formula to to speaking out. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Jose, well, I have a question for you. Do you feel like queer BIPOC folks are seen within the larger gay rights movement? <laughs> Um, I only laugh because of a tweet I posted today that says something along the lines, if your if your queerness is not rooted in racial justice, then you're not queer, you're just a gay Karen. <laughs> and I mean that wholeheartedly as someone who has who organized in 2008, you know, and was very much here in California organizing around marriage equality. But I will never forget that when uh, trans Latina activist Genice Gutierrez was invited to a White House dinner and she and she heckled Obama demanding to end the deportations and the misgendering of, of trans siblings, it was gay white men who booed her. I, I don't I don't forget that. And you know, I think for a long time, especially as a young organizer, I spent so much time trying to you know, and I was young. I mean, I was like 16, 17, talking about like marriage equality. And I was also like, but we got to survive bullying. I am not a fan of the it gets better rhetoric because my job is to say that it gets better assumes that, you know, that you're going to have access and the privilege to better, which is not the case for a lot of folks, a lot of folks who look like me. So my job is not to tell you it gets better. My job is to say I will fight to make it better and provide you the access to fight alongside with me. Because my job is not to be a savior of anyone, but rather to be an accomplice to people's healing and liberation. I think the it gets better rhetoric is very much rooted in gay white men and in, and in that nuclear family that we see. And I'm not so much a part of that politic. Um, oh, I just started up some part. I just realized everything that I said. And I was like, uh uh, but you know what? It's okay. Put me on the record. I've been doing this for 15 years. I got the receipts. It's okay. You know? <laughs> So I think that, no, I think, and I've said this before, I think I'd rather be the only queer person at a straight bar of people of color than to be the only person of color at a gay bar. I don't. I, I At the end of the day, I carry my sexuality the way I carry my skin. My sexuality and the color of my skin and the displacement of my identity are one in the same. You know, it's not the same to be a jota, which is a term that comes from Mexico and a reclamation of that. Um, and, and, and what it means to be a gay white person, I don't. I think now a lot of my own politics around organizing is that I spend too much time trying to get other folks who don't who don't look like me to understand and to justify myself in, in, in the system. And at the end of the day now, it's like I'd rather spend that energy defending my own because these systems are not going to do it for me. So to, to very much to what Gabby says, right? Like, I think it's important to be out on the streets. You know, I did that for a long time. And now I know that I can infiltrate in other spaces. I can come back to this organizing of within, without, and against the state. I will always be against the state. Sometimes I work within it and sometimes without it. But my spirit will always be against it. So I think that at large, no, the conversation, it's still, it's, no, I, 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 I don't know. Like, you know, I, I feel like I spent so much time 
trying to think of myself within this construct of gayness and realizing, well, I'm not gay. Like, you know, my construct of queerness is so much rooted in my politic as a person of color. You know, like I'm from South Central and I'm never going to move from South Central. And it's okay. My job is to organize my hood and to say, look, look, I may be femme, but don't be bold. In set forties and martinis in one city, in old English for me, please. You know what I mean? Like I grew up on Cold Forty Five and Newports, and yes, we're also fat. But you know, <laughs> like that's my commitment. I think to me right now, there's greater harm happening in my communities to the point, you know, what Fatima said, right? You know, mm-hmm. the fact that trans siblings were murdered two weeks ago. You know, I don't know if I can listen, fuck that. You know, like we need to be defending trans siblings, right? The fact that young children were being uncovered in these tombs, like neo-colonialism is still happening. There's too many sy- systems for me to focus and trying to be um, kin with some white gay person in West Hollywood. No, no, I need to defend my community first. Centrification and all the issues of that, that's too real. Like I am here on this planet to take account for what my ancestors left behind. Like I'm here to continue their fight. Thank you. Oh, I just started up some pods. Oh, (laughs) happy pride. (laughs) Happy pride. (laughs) Asher. How can the Black Lives uh, Black Lives Matter Black Lives Matter movement stop uh, AAPI hate campaign and other similar movements help advance equity in the BIPOC community? You know, I think that um, I think what's really interesting about all of those and what we were just talking about is that there is a commonality of struggle. There is a commonality of oppression. And um, and let me just back that up to you know the, the previous question a little bit that you know there is racism there is uh, transphobia within the LGB community for sure and I think that I I, I want to understand what people uh, how people are motivated and why that is we have to think about the fact that all of us under the the the, the rainbow flag grew up oppressed and, uh, and, and othered or, uh, or being an outsider. And the sense of need to belong is incredibly strong for all of us. And we, we all learn different models of how to do that. But I can't help but think about you know, our queer history, the heroes and the courageousness and the sacrifices that have been made to bring us to where we are today. And to think about, you know, that's all of our struggle. That is something that we are all going to have to get together and work with each other and understand that we have all been outsiders. And how do we have that commonality? Where do we find the same struggles? Where do we find the same solutions? How can we share those and and work together? Because um, because we are a minority and we need to have the strength of uh, banding together and understanding all of the different flavors of our stories so that we can work with each other, respect each other, give each other dignity, and then we can get together and make some change. Thank you. Um, Fatima, what are some of the aspects of being a Black trans woman for your BIPOC? person you wish that people knew about you? That by and large, I am respectful of any and everyone and the position that they hold in life, regardless of whether they are, you know, rich or poor, black or white, you know, um, straight or or gay or how we, we identify. Um, what I wish people would really know is that I am an extremely approachable individual and I like to, I like to learn and be, and I like to be informative, you know, at the end of the day, there's nothing that ever happens anywhere in the world involving people that doesn't require a conversation before it happens. The best of things happen, a conversation needs to happen before that goes down. A war goes on. People just don't run out in the street and start fighting. There's a conversation that takes place before a war happens. So before you make any attempt to tell me 
who I am or who you think I should be, I wish people would understand and know that you, you can have a conversation with me, you know, and we can agree to disagree and still be okay, you know, and still be okay. Um, and like I said earlier, you should also know that if you choose not to have a conversation with me, then you should choose to stay away from me, you know, because I am a 58 year old African trans woman living in a world that wants to write us out of existence. And because of a few smart out of the ass people that hold some power have given license to people to harm us. So I am a nervous and sometimes armed individual, you know, and I have family, you know what I mean? One of my children just transitioned. So, you know, I have friends that I love and care about and that sometimes I think love, love and care about me. You know? so, I, so, but always know that I am strong enough, I am bold enough to break the rules and I'm strong enough to make my own. And what I take, I keep, you know, Know that. Yeah. You're perfect, whole and complete, Fatima. We love you. Thank you. Gabby, what are some of the more important milestones or societal changes that have been made in advancement in advancing uh queer pop visibility, human rights, and inclusion? I think the the milestones is has been, um, and I think Fatima said said a, a word that really um, is true for 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 to answer that question, is that we've become bold, and we've stopped apologizing for who we are. And if space is not given, we take up space. And we've stopped saying I'm sorry if you feel that way. Fuck you if you feel that way. Mm -hmm. Lean into your discomfort. If you're a true ally, you will lean into how uncomfortable you are, that you do have a history of being a colonizer, that you do have a history of bringing slaves to this country, of putting people in concentration camps. Maybe not you necessarily, but your ancestry. You need to be okay being uncomfortable, but leaning in listening to us, listening to where we're coming from. And I think that, you know, we now have different, you know, in, in the theme of, of, of pride and what it means to, to many of us, you know, we have different Latino pride, we have uh, indigenous pride, which we don't celebrate in June, we celebrate in, in October, October of Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, but you know, we 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 have achieved so much. It's not enough, but we have achieved so much. Um, and I think that just having the space right here, right now, to speak about where we're at, what we have to contribute, and we've contributed so much that that other people have claimed it as their own, from music to poetry to film to social movements, we've been there. We were just, you know, not given the credit. But sorry if I curse, but fuck that. <laughs> yes, oh my yes. Oh my God, when I say that I love you, that means that you awaken a place in me where I feel the love. And this has been outstanding. I have one more question I want each of, each of you to have a moment to answer, and it is, how can people be better allies to the BIPOC queer community? Jose? I think it's something something that Gabby said, right? One, um, I just laugh at some of the things that I say. I like to think that I do woke jokes. <laughs> like I'm about to like, you know, give some knowledge and information and add some comedy to it. So I just remembered one of the things that I said. You know, I feel like a lot of times right now on social media, we see something like, you are your ancestors' wildest dreams, you know? And, mm -hmm. and I truly really believe that, right? Like it's our ancestors' resiliency that allowed for my survival in my life in this lifetime. And and then at the end, I said, why, folks, I don't think this pertains to you. You need to be your ancestors healers because they fucked up. 
<laughs> and the only reason I share that is because I think one reconciling with that with that with that history is important, right? So in my spiritual practice, a lot of the the reconnecting with ancestry is important. Like I've had to reconcile with the fact that some of my ancestors uh, were colonizers. I mean, it's kind of part of the narrative of sort of the diaspora of, of, of this, you know, shade of, of, of brown. And so I think about that and I'm like, okay, cool. I'll deal with them in the afterlife, but in this lifetime, I got this skin color. You know what I mean? So I think one reconciling with that past is important. I think like like Gabby also said, leaning into the discomfort. I also have a lot of discomfort. A lot of my of my work has been unpacking anti-blackness within Latino culture. I think now there's something that I've learned that to say anti-racist is no longer enough. Like pro-blackness, I think is enough. A lot of my own uh, the colorism that I've experienced, right, is rooted in anti-blackness through through another avenue, but it's rooted in that same uphold, uh, you know, upholding white supremacy, right? So I think that that's important. Um, listening, knowing that sometimes you are not the one for the conversation. Uh, I laughed after I said what I said, and, and, and Fatima came out dropping something. I was like, oh, I know what you're trying to tell me, Fatima. <laughs> I appreciated that moment. And, you know, sometimes, uh, like Fatima, I think I'm an approachable person, but know where my politics lie. You know what I mean? Like, I will definitely, you know, I, I say that I believe in people, but not humanity. I don't know if that makes sense, but I'm like, <laughs> look at capitalism and the world. And uh, But, you know, I think to everything that Gabby said, reconciling with history of of not so great history, learning from it and reimagining a better world. I think as, as as we're deconstructing systems, it's also important to envision a new world. We need visionaries alongside as we also have people at the forefront in deconstructing worlds, because then what are we getting to, you know? Um, and leaning into the discomfort, listening and acknowledging that sometimes you are not the, the one to have that conversation. And one thing for me, it's also been like, I don't need to be the face of everything. I think, you know, I had been before, but now I don't need to do that. No, I, you know, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Passion. I would say make it personal. I would say if you are an ally, then ask. Find out more about what, uh, how we came about uh, discovering our own identities, how we identify, what it's been like for us. And I think that there is still a lot of fear about just asking, you know, what uh, what's your dating life like, you know, and how's that going for you? Um, and I think that the more that we can understand that everybody's experience is slightly different. I did not have the same experience as all Chinese Americans or all gay men. And I am happy to tell you my story and how I came about to uh, discovering who I am uh, if you ask me respectfully. And then, it, I mean, it is an intimate act too, to say, tell me something about who you really are and the moments that changed your life. So, you know, approach it gently, but I think most of us would be very open to letting you know all of our, all the different parts of ourselves instead of, you know, uh, stereotyping that and assuming or just pretending it doesn't exist by not talking about it too much. Wow. Well, um, I could probably I could probably sum it up by just saying if you want to know who I am, if you want to know where I'm from, then you need to see what I see, do what I do, walk in my shoes, walk to, walk with me, talk to me. You know what I'm saying? Listen to the things that I have to say. You have to see my vision and your vision. You know. You have to, um, I was training for, when I was in the military, I was training for um, scene of an accident fights. You know, when you go in after a battle is taking place and you, and you see exactly what took place, where it took place, and you know how to find people if you lost someone and things of that nature. So you see the world differently through that set of eyes. When you walk onto a scene, a firefight, you see the world very, very differently through that set of eyes. So what people should do is, Make some sort of an attempt to see the world that I walk through every day through my vision. You know, see what I see. Pay my type of dues. You know what I'm saying? Understand what it's like to uh, um, always have the blues about who you are. Now, for me, I recognized many, many years ago 
that I have not one but two superpowers. The first one is I can I can never be able to get rid of. I am black, right? And I refuse to let people make my blackness a crutch, you know, or make my blackness something that is a bad thing, like it imbued, you know, your your pretty Snow White village or something like that. You know what I mean? My blackness is my strength. I recognize that it is a certain amount of power involved in just simply being black. I recognize that when I walk into a space, I am immediately noticed. How I leave that space will depend on how I take that notice and utilize it or not. I used to come into a room and kind of try to get out of everybody's way and not be noticed, you know, and just speak when spoken to, that kind of a thing. Now, when I walk into a space, you knew I was coming before I got there. So okay. now it's up to you to determine whether or not you're going to stay there when I get there, be gone before I get there, or walk with me when I leave. You know, because I am not bowing to anyone. I will brook no opposition. You know, I can negotiate. I got no problem with that. But I'm not negotiating the way my freedom, my liberty, my happiness, my dignity. I'm not negotiating the way any of that. You know, I spent 15 years, 18 total in the Department of Corrections. You know, I gave that time away. I did that. You know what I mean? I'm not doing that again. And I'm not going to let anyone take that from me. And I'm not going to let anybody tell me that I don't exist. I wake up every morning. I put my big girl panties on and whatever pair of heels or sneakers I decide that I want to wear. And I walk out my door with my head held high and my shoulders back. I'm 10 feet tall on the shoulders of a 10 foot giant. I'm going to stay there. If you knock the giant down below me, then you got to deal with me. So you might as well have an understanding as to who we are. Have these conversations. If you want to be my ally, man, you need to just walk with me. That's all you got to do. A lot of the times you don't have to say shit. Just walk with me and see what we deal with every day. And ask yourself, would you want to deal with that in your life every day? That's all you got to do to be my ally. But you can't play games with me. You can't try to, you know, you can't sugarcoat nothing. I am the most non-politically correct person since Lenny Bruce and Richard Pryor. You need to know that if you want to roll with me. You know? <laughs> That's what you need to do to be an ally of mine. Simple as that. All right, Mishpaz. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Gabby. Um, to me, allyship is something that we practice a lot when we do trainings in HIV. The, some of the rules, step up, step down. A true ally will know when to stand by my side, have my back, but will also know when to step back and let me shine. Not try to speak for me, not, not try and say my story, my narrative in their view, but say, you know what? She got this. Let her speak. So I think that that you know outside of what everyone has said, you know, I, for me that's that's what being an ally is. Wow, this has been a beautiful moment. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Just dropping, dropping, dropping seeds and bombs and all you know, just everything. So we're going to allow questions to be asked of you from the uh, audience, from the amazing audience, folks watching us. And Delena is going to um, read some of the questions. I'll let you answer for them. Okay, Delena. Okay, so um, the first question um, that we got, and I just published it so everyone can see it. Um, so this is for Jasmine. As a trans woman in the entertainment industry, have you noticed shifts since the transgender tipping point edition of Time magazine came out when Laverne Cox was the first trans person on the cover? Have I noticed the shift? Is that what's being asked of me? Most yes. definitely, yes, in a in a in the most amazing way. Like uh, I've had the honor and the privilege 
of um, having beautiful intimate moments with Laverne. I'm just so proud that um, she has been able to really radiate and step into her, her greatness. But she's an extremely smart young woman. And that's it, it, because she um, radiates on so many levels. It, people look ha, have an opportunity to look at us um, dimensional. I think um, prior to that, the way people were writing stories and telling stories, um, uh, oftentimes we're not fully um, evolved or developed, right? So I'm so grateful for my time. Like I always, I do not ever dis discredit the work that I did, whether it was in comedy, um, sitcom, the dramatic uh, one hour, you know, episodes. I'm so grateful for those moments because but when I tell people they're not giving out those jobs, you have to go through a process, right? Um, the beautiful thing about what's happening now with disclosure, with pose, it's like we're able to go and write those stories, right? We get to write them and imagine them from our own imagination and not someone else's idea of who we are or who they think we are. So it's just getting, it's getting more, you know, there's lots more work to do. Because um, Jose was saying there's so many beautiful identities and genders that we need to explore and tell stories about. But the fact that um, there's this, um, there's these eyes, right? There's this um, um, curiosity that is on the on on us um, is 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 fa it's fabulous. It's fabulous. So I continue to write. I continue to perform. I continue to do my show because. Um, my show matters, it counts, and I enjoy what I do. I enjoy putting on a good show. So I'm going to answer the question. Okay, so I believe the panelists already touched upon this earlier, but I'll ask this one because we got this in the moderator chat. Um, thank you to panelists and staff for this illuminating conversation. Violence against BIPOC and LGBTQ people is so awful and disheartening. To amplify the moderator's final question, how can we be better allies in everyday exchanges with everyone we interact with? I'll just, I, I think, you know, I, it, we've, we've all said very similar things in, in our own little pizzazz and sazon, like we say in Spanish, los saborcito. But I think, you know, Gabby said something that to me was very powerful. I think it's important to realize that we are not voiceless. You know, I think when folks say, want to be the voice of the voiceless, it becomes a little bit of a turnoff. It's like, no, I'm not voiceless. It's just that your radio wasn't tuned into my voice. It's different, right? Like turning up the vo volume when important and necessary. Uh, I, you know, also want to echo what Asher said about being curious about who we are as people and and we're all, we're not hegemonic. Like Latino, Latinx folk are not hegemonic at all. And then you want to add queerness on top of that. And we're not monolithic, you know, uh, folks in, 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 and so different. So I think being curious about that is important as well. I'll just, I, those are some of the things that resonated with me and then other folks can add to that. Does anyone else want to speak to that? Asher? Hey. I just want to say that, um, especially in Pride Month, you know, that um, that I think that we should be very proud of the hard work that's been done. And I think that being an ally to, to us is, it's not charity and it's not pity. It's an opportunity for you to come along on an amazing ride with incredible people who are living out loud as their true selves, I mean, that's a privilege. That's what I think. Fatima. Oh. Yeah, I agree. I agree with what Ashley just said. It, it, it is a privilege. You know, it takes, I don't know what people would think, you know, it is for us to be who we are, but it takes a lot of strength to do, you know, to do what we do to get up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm not gonna do what the normal people or the so-called normal people think that I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not gonna identify in this heteronormative type of a thing, you know. I have a certain level of masculinity about me because I chose to keep it that way. Because um, in my world, 
when I have a partner, my partner is, is I'm dedicated and devoted. So in that world, I do the things that I feel like I need to do, basically, because I'm an alpha dominant person. I provide, protect, and I love them, you know. So I'm doing the same thing that the cisgendered individual is doing with, you know, his or her partner. So, yeah, I mean, damn, it, it's really not that complicated, man. Most of these things are, are just basically simple common sense, you know. All you have to do is take the person that um, you dislike because of their lifestyle and, and make that your reflection. You know, look at yourself and say, how would I feel if someone disrespected a member of my family in that manner? You know, it's like using derogatory language um, as part of your normal vocabulary every day, all day. You know, how would you feel if uh, someone called your sister, your daughter, your aunt, your mom, or your grandmother a bitch or a hoe, you know, would you not deem that disrespectful to your family member? And if you do, why would you use that language on someone else? You know, so if you felt like someone calling your brother um, a fag or your sister a dyke, you know, why would you talk to one of us like that? You know, I was sitting at a 7-Eleven about a month ago, and this guy walked over, and he said, man, you got some big old, and I said, let me ask you a question. See, most of the time, I would have just went left. But this day, I was actually feeling pretty good, and I said, I'm going to have a conversation. So I asked him, I said, let me ask you a question, man. Would you just walk up to any woman on the street, you know, and ask them and, and say that to them? You know what I'm saying? Would you allow someone to say that to your daughter or your sister? And he had to think about that for a minute, and then it just tried to cap. He was like, yeah, I'll do that. I was like, no, you wouldn't. You know, you, you absolutely would not. Most people wouldn't, but they take the liberty to feel like the, the things that they say to us is cool. The things that they do with us is, is okay because, you know, we ain't nobody. We, we just some weird people that live in West Hollywood. We don't all live in West Hollywood. Hell, the people that live in West Hollywood don't even want us living in West Hollywood. You know, it's that gay white privilege kind of a thing. I'm like, come on, man, please knock it off. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's. And when you're choosing an ally, when you're choosing allies, it's hard because you never know if they're there for sound bites or something. So when I do open air events, I always tell people, if you're here for a special moment with a photograph or a sound bite, you need to find your car because we're not down with that. You know, we're here to make some things happen, to make life happen and to uh, make sure as best as possible, that every time we leave this space, the people that enjoy this space with us leave here educated, informed, stronger, and willing to take the sacrifices that are required with leadership. The first one, I think that, that people that that are asking or the person that is asking, you know, how could they be a better ally? I think that, that um, along the lines of what um, others have said is, are you doing this for us or are you doing this for you? Um, because many times, you know, we're good. We got each other, like we don't need you, but there's acts of kindness that don't have to be capture on a on a video on a photo we don't we don't we don't need you know we don't need you at our at our bars at our at the places that we that those are our, our sanctuaries like go somewhere else um but i think that you know the more the merrier the more people that have our backs that speak um in the spaces that maybe you know if you're into politics and, and you have a level of influence, speak on our behalf in those cases. Let's invite us, you know, to be at the table. Mm -hmm. Let us have a seat at the table. Let us be part of, of, of changing policies. You know, allow us that opportunity. You know, if not, like, like we've said, you know, we will be taking up those spaces. But I think that true allies, um, will just show up without being asked and will step away, you know, when they know they're in the way. Excellent. Very good. 
I got some more questions that came in. Um, these are personal questions, so however you want to answer them. People are asking, how did you identify, how did your identity affect, it, affect your journey? Who would like to go? Jose, you want to go in order? Did Jose? she say, did they say at your job? I'm sorry, how did your identity affect that, affect your journey? Yeah, um, yeah, I don't mind going. Um, I think in the beginning, uh, because I came out at a very young age, I came out when I was eight years old. Um, and I came out because my logic was very simple, y'all. I'm such a beautiful, romantic person, but I'm left-handed. And I literally thought that being queer was like being left-handed. Like most people are right-handed. Some of us are blessed being left-handed, but we all right at the end of the day. So I was like, well, most boys like girls, but some of us are blessed liking boys, but we're all boys at the end of the day. And literally in the third grade, I told the boy to be my Valentine and then systems, you know, became a true thing. So I definitely think that my identity has been, it's, it's magic. It's, it's magic. I, I say that when I meet my creator and spirit and my orishas, I'm going to ask them to make me queer and queer and queer again in all lifetimes because it is magical. To know that to embody all of these things that shouldn't exist and to be the intersection of past, present, and future in one body is an honor. Um, I think now I've learned that my body is something to be prayed to, not prayed for. And, yeah. and, 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 and carrying that truth with me has been so magical, but it has been 30 years of unpacking. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's been a whole journey of that. Um, I need everything that I do with my queerness from everything as an artist, as a poet, as a person, as an urban planner. Um, it's just something so magical and I really love and enjoy being a queer creature, especially now, right? Pandemic taught us that this is some sci-fi plot. So I was like, man, I'm an alien. <laughs> and what? Back away from me. I got magical powers, force field. Like, you know, I'm about to repel straightness. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, and there's been, there's been ups and downs for sure. Um, uh, I think more right right now. Also, what's been super beautiful and important for me has been also honoring the fact that the moment I came out the closet, um, also did my parents, specifically my mother. Um, and I am blessed to have a, a a good relationship with my mother, and she's also had to come out as a, a queer parent. You know what I mean? And someone who is my mother, and I used to have longer hair. And, uh, you know, she used to do trenzas and she used to, you know, do little trenzas for me. And I sat at her, at her feet and we would have conversations. And, you know, in hindsight, it was like, here is this male presenting body, you know, her son, she calls me still he, him and her son. And it doesn't bother me. I know the relationship I have with my mother. And she did not know that she was feeding this femme spirit that lived inside of me. And so I've been more compassionate to my parents' traumas and learn to see them as people. And once they did that, it was like, okay, cool. And it's only, I think, that my queer my queer identity has allowed me to be compassionate to their trauma as well. Thank you, Jose. That was fire. Passion? Well, I can't speak for all Chinese Americans or all Asian people, but it is not entirely uncommon for these cultures and these value systems to really put a priority on image and the idea of what is perfect or successful is something that I grew up with. And it was something that I think contributed to delaying my coming out until I was 23. Uh, but here's the interesting part. Here's the gift of, of being queer. It made me really consider what it is that I like about myself, what my strengths are, and who I really am. And if I had just followed the life template that was handed to me, then I may have never discovered those things. So in that sense, you know, it, it, it can be tough growing up queer, but it, there's a hidden gift in the fact that it demands that you answer the question, who are you and what do you like about yourself? Thank you, Ashley. Yeah. Man, that's an interesting question. I don't think I've ever been asked that question, at least in that, in that context. 
I didn't have a traditional coming out story. It just kind of happened one day, you know, like it was one of those things. But I've always known who I am. And I grew up in Brooklyn and I grew up in a neighborhood where knowing who you are meant that you had to be able to handle your business, take care of yourself. You know, you couldn't come to the park and play ball unless we knew that you can fight in case some people from another neighborhood came through and wanted to start some trouble with that kind of a thing. Um, I believe, however, that me knowing who I am informed the other part of my journey in life. You're right, the part that kept me being, you know, and getting in trouble all of the time and kept me living in, the, in this darkness all of the time. But it also fueled my desire as a writer because I'm, I'm also a spoken word artist and I spent some years doing deaf poetry, stuff like that. Um, and moments in time have become, epip uh, you know, epiphanies for me. There is someone says something or I witness something, you know, what, you know, moving around through my city that makes me say, well, I want to aspire to move in that direction, or I'm not going to go in that direction, or I'm not going to do these particular things. And thinking about those things, though, it never occurred to me that being informed about what I will and will not do, what my limits are, what my boundaries are, it never occurred to me that those things will event would eventually um, culminate in me being who I am today at 58 years old. It took a long time to make me. I'm really happy with me. You know, I am really happy with me. One of my biggest pastimes when I was younger is, you know, I love to read. But I used to like to read a lot about Greek and, 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 and Roman mythology, mostly because I like the fact that the gods could pretty much do what the hell they wanted to do and, no one, <laughs> and didn't have to answer to it. You know what I mean? Um, but one of the intriguing things was the, the, the types of punishment that they inflicted on sometimes even each other, you know? Um, Prometheus was chained to a rock for giving man fire, you know, and had to endure like a crow or something eating his liver like every day, you know what I'm saying? Sisyphus had to push a big ass boulder up a hill only for it to roll back down the hill again and he to do it all over. If you look at that, if you look at that, you would think like that's the complete definition of, of, of insanity. You know, if I push a rock up a hill and it rolls down, guess where that rock is staying, you know? But if you look at your life, we've been pushing that boulder up a hill for a long time now, and it's been rolling back down, and then we got to push it up again, and it's been rolling back down. However, the one thing that I did discover was at the moment that I decided to let go of what other people thought and just say, fuck it. If somebody says, yo, you know what? I think that you this. I'm, and, I, and I say, yeah, I am. So what? See, now you got nothing to throw at me. And that's like a whole planet being lifted off of your shoulders. And man, it ain't nothing more beautiful in this world than being a woman. So my life outside of thinking about, you know, my gender identity actually informed what my journey became and created the person that is borderline nutcase right now that everybody... <laughs> Really likes to hear speak. <laughs> we, we love you. You rock with me. Yeah, yeah, Gabby. Um, I I love what Fatima said about you know the traditional coming out. I'm like I didn't have one of those <laughs> either. Um, but you know, um, I think that for me everything has been a gain. Um, the only loss was that boys couldn't have me anymore um but uh, and 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 so i've gained everything i've gained self-confidence i've gained you know being uh assertive and and truly standing in my truth and and who i am and and not caring what i've lost and that that was family that was friends that was you know just people that that it was it was uh, it was good that they weren't no longer in my life and and you know the biggest challenge I want to say is having to to fill those traditional roles those expectations that were imposed on me of what I what other people what my family what my culture said I had to be I had to get married I had to have children I had to be you know a housewife and I never fit in those in those 
um, those cultural norms, uh, those, I never feel those, those expectations. Therefore, my family who loved me had to accept or not, and I didn't care that they didn't accept the fact that, you know, that I'm a lesbian. Uh, but after, after, you know, it was said and done, people have, have, you know, supported me and have had my back and have celebrated me. Um, and so I think that, that, that everything that I've lived, good and bad, I love who I am right now. And it's a result of everything that I've lived through. So I wouldn't change my, my, my journey at all. I wouldn't take away the, the painful pieces of it um, because even the pain um, has made me who I am today and I love who I am. So thank you for, for, for the question. You wanna know how you play, how you're healing. What are you doing for self care, Jose? I am laughing a lot. <laughs> I've discovered during the pandemic that I am addicted to laughter. And if I can never contribute to anyone's laughter, that's, it, you know, it's an honor and it just becomes a whole, you know, cycle of laughter. But I really enjoy laughing and comedy um, and trying to remember joy. Um, also writing, writing poetry. Again, I mentioned I'm a poet and a lot of my poetry is is bilingual, mostly English and then some in Spanish. But recently I've been uh, challenged to write completely in Spanish. And that's been really, really fun to find, um, to know that my heart can, all, can feel in two languages means that I can also love in two languages. And a girl's always in love. <laughs> I mean, I'm always in love, let's be real. So those are some of my self cares, yeah. Thank you, Asha. Uh, I am a therapist, but I also have a therapist. It is one of the most delicious luxuries in life to be able to sit and just talk about yourself for an hour without worrying or thinking about it. And it is, uh, it, it keeps me sane just to be able to have a space that I can totally be myself. So that's really helpful. Um, exercise, some activity, uh, some way to sweat and, and move, super important for mental health. And, uh, and it, it just feels great too. Um, and then I like cooking. I'm, you know, I, I, I could just keep learning more about different cultures, techniques and everything for the rest of my life. And that is, uh, that's a place where, uh, not only can I enjoy it, but I get to share it with other people. Fatima. I actually suck at self care. I really do. Um, cause I, I've never known what the definition for that was. And then I just. But, I, you know, I like to play ball. I like to, you know, I, get, I get my exercise in it. I go to the beach. I like to swim, you know, things of that nature. But really, my self-care is really about taking care of someone else, or at least trying to, you know. So on that note, basically, um, about a week or so ago, I announced, apparently everybody didn't hear us, but I announced um, the, the, the building or the opening of the Fatima Speaks LLC uh, Mutual Aid Foundation. So it is under the umbrella of my company, Fatima Speaks LLC, and basically it's a continuing animal that's growing on its own. Um, and the whole point is to be able to take care of people who are in immediate need, people from our community who need, you know, to help pay their rent or pay a car note or whatever the case may be, because I've, you know, had to benefit from that on more than one occasion in this last 15 months, because though I own my own business, I do cultural competence trainings and stuff like what we're doing now. And that used to be, you know, contingent upon face-to-face -face kind of work. And that went like out the window with, with COVID. So I'm really just getting back into a regular flow where, you know, work is on a consistent basis. So there's been some times when, you know, came up short a little bit. So I'm just trying to make sure people, I'm paying back, I'm paying forward what people have done for me. You know, so that's my idea, self care. So, uh, you know, anybody that wants to donate, I guess we can talk about that at the end of this. Um, but there is a, a cash app for, for donations. And if you need a receipt, you can attach, like, you know, whatever information you need to to that. And I'll make sure you get your receipt so you can get that back in taxes. You know, uh, but that's my idea, self care, making sure people are good, you know. Yeah. 
um, gardening. I love to garden. Um, I love planting stuff. I love uh, the process of seeing it grow and going out there. Um, I think it's very much in the line of what Fatima um, does as well. Uh, but I, I get this, this, this sense of nurturing something um, and seeing it grow. Um, that just is so, so, so fulfilling. Um, cooking is, is my other, uh, my other way of, of taking care of myself because I find it to be so therapeutic. I love to be in the kitchen by myself and, and be in my own thoughts while I'm preparing a meal that will nourish not only my body, but my loved one's bodies. Um, so that's the way that I, that I take care of myself and, and, um, I would just encourage everyone to to do both or either. But if you're going to be doing cooking, make sure that you're also exercising because <laughs> all that good food just stays on your hips. <laughs> I love the food. <laughs> Thank you. All right. They want to know, what do you believe to be true for you, Jose? What I for me? Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> what I believe to be true for me? Oh my goodness. Um, you know what? One of the things that I've had to admit, I feel I've been told a lot that I love hard, uh, and I think because of imposter syndrome and other things. Um, it, this is something that I say in one of my poems, but it's like when you grow up poor, you realize that love is the only currency you'll never run out of. I only love this hard because love is my resistance and my body knows nothing else but fight. Um, and I think now where I'm at in my life is I've given, I've given, I've leaned into the fact that I am a lover. I was raised by novelas after all. <laughs> so I give in to that joy for sure. And and I love hard. I love deeply, but more, but more than that, not only do I love, you know, partners, but my family, my community, this world, like, you know, I was definitely cursed with being an empath. That's why I say that I like people, but not humanity, because to feel the feelings of humanity is a lot. I was a kid that stood in front of the TV, you know, like, and Asher knows this, because empathy, I believe at least that people can build empathy, but not everyone is an empath, because that's a whole different situation. Therapy taught me how to build empathy as a social worker myself, but let me tell you, <laughs> Asher knows. So I, I, I thank you for your service, Asher. Um, and so I think that that's my truth. I'm always will be a lover. It's 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 magical, and so I hold on to that as truth. Um, uh, what I what comes to mind for me right now is I know that I am living my purpose right now, and it is incredibly fulfilling and gratifying. It it has brought into focus why I've had the diverse experiences I've had in my life, good and bad, and has brought me to this moment and given me all of the tools that I need to go do what I need to be doing in life. And the pursuit of that is, I mean, this will evolve. I, I don't know if I've found it, but it, that's what it is right now. And it may evolve into something else, but I am open to that and I'm always searching for uh, a deeper understanding of myself and my place in the world. So uh, that's what I know to be true right now. Thank you, Asha. Fatima? Oh, you're on mute, Fatima. Okay, it did, my screen doesn't say that. And now you're on, now you're on. Yeah, I guess okay. we can hear you now. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, I know that uh, there was a period in my life when I couldn't stand to be with myself, to be alone with myself, right? I know that there was a period in my life where I questioned everything about me, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, I questioned all of those things. Um, but the one thing that I do know is that I am who I am. I will always be who I am. Nothing will shake me or move me or uh, or, or slide past me and make me think that I'm anything other than who I am. I am very happy with who I am. 
And if you aren't cool with that, I'm fine with you not being cool with it, you know? Um, and all of those things, the good and the bad and the ugly and the, the days and the nights of being angry or crying or depressed or whatever the case may be, suicidal ideations, all of those things have come together to make the person that I am now. So the one thing that I do know to be true is that this is who I'm supposed to be and I'm living the life that I'm supposed to be living. And I'm fine with that. Um, I am many things, but the one thing that I love being is, and this is, this is, this I know, um, I'm an educator. I love sharing knowledge with people. I love sharing life experiences, uh, good and bad, the ugly, the dirty, the, because I think that when we, when we become an open book, when we share parts, pieces, or episodes of our lives with people, someone's going to benefit from that. Um, just the way that, you know, the three of us, the four of us, um, you know, who, who are here, talking about, you know, pieces of, of ourselves, pieces of our lives, someone in the audience will hear something, will connect with that, um, and it will take them somewhere. They, 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 it, will, it will echo in their heart, and they will something, something. So I think that, that sharing knowledge um, is powerful, um, and I think that a lot of people are very resistant to to share things about their lives because it makes them vulnerable. Um, but I think that vulnerability and sharing it gives us more back than what's taken away from us. So that's what I know that about me and about my truth is that if I could if I could educate, if I could share knowledge, I'm good. Last thoughts, last words. Anyone have anything they want to say as we close out, Jose? Um, all I all I added that it's an honor to to be in this virtual space with you all. I think I even in, in this I've had great conversations. I've learned a lot from all of you, and it's always beautiful and an honor to be in company of other queer folks of color. I love y'all, and y'all are magical, and I continue. I I curse you with blessings and joy. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. I I think that in Pride Month, you know, we have fantastic celebrations, and that is so good. It is so needed and so deserved. But just take a little bit and give back. Find a way to make our lives better tomorrow. It doesn't have to be a huge thing. It can be small, but every contribution is going to make change for the better for all of us. Uh, first of all, can we all just give like all praise to Miss Jasmine for <laughs> the work that she does and what she's doing this evening? Please just give Jasmine a round of applause for being the amazing woman that she is and doing all of the great things that she does. Period. Let's just do that first. All right. Um, much Thank love you. to you, Jasmine. Big fan all the time. So I just wanted to do that and thank everyone else for participating as well. So I don't know. I think my only thought is let's just make tomorrow so amazing that it'll make today jealous and the day after tomorrow upset about yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Bettina. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Gabby. I think that we should end with Fatima. It's been an honor. It's been an honor. <laughs> awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I want to personally thank Santa Monica, the city of Santa Monica. I want to thank David, Delena, for in this invite and making this happen. I want to thank Elizabeth, who happens to be a board member where I work at APIT, and she's also uh, helping that community uh, partnership team 
advisors. So I just want to thank her for recommending me. And thank you for, to each and every one of you that um, attended this uh, most you know, amazing event. You know, we will continue showing up and showing out. We will, you know, live our lives um, authentically and audaciously, right? Um, we will, you know, love good and love wide and hard and, you know, we'll eat and celebrate and we'll find time for play, right? We will uh, remain curious about playtime and being playful. We won't write ourselves out of our own imaginations, right? And we, we, we will... Um, celebrate our pride, our, our, uh, our lives. So thank you so much again. And I so look forward to holding space with you. And um, as we come out of this pandemic, you know, um, I enjoy in everything and all things that we do. All right. Good night to you all. Asher, did you have something to say? I did. I just wanted to say that, you know, I, I think that this conversation has been amazing. We've learned so many different facets and textures of, of our experience. But I wanted to make sure that, um, uh, you know, we all want to make sure that that uh, everybody can walk away from this conversation and be able to uh, build on it or gain access to all the things that our community has built. So uh, we have a list of resources for uh, LGBTQ plus um, uh, people, and uh, you can find it um, on my website at ashertherapy.com slash LGBTQ. It is by no means a exhaustive list. Please email me if you would like to be added to it, and, uh, and please pass it on to anybody who can use these resources. Excellent. I totally forgot. I said I was going to remind myself to speak on it at the end. I totally forgot. But okay. thank you. Yeah, and we have a plethora of information that we can uh, bestow upon you. So, yeah, just reach out and uh, send a little email or text, and we'll take care of you. Is that it for us tonight, Elena, David? Yes, thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Good night.